Amen. I like to have a little fun. All right. Now, if you want to get out ahead of me, the first chunk of scriptures we're going to go to, and don't worry, I made sure they were right this time, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. The first chunk we're going to go through is verses 26 through 38, and then later on we'll do another part of that chapter. And if you're taking notes tonight, and I do hope that you are, I've, the title I have for this is The Magnificat. Now I, and oddly for me, I've actually got more words than scriptures this time, breaking my form, I know. I love the holidays. I love time with family. I love getting time. <laughs> she went like this. <laughs> oh, I love our church. I love getting to relax and refresh around the holidays. And the time off work ain't bad either. But sometimes... I have a hard time getting into what people call the spirit of Christmas. And I know that celebrating the birth of Jesus unites Christians and believers all over the world. I know, I'm sorry, lost my place. And I love that in spite of commercialization, people griping and grousing about different things they don't like about Christmas, about how Jesus wasn't born on the 25th of December or all these other kinds of stuff. I, it's not that big a deal. They don't think maybe that Santa Claus should be involved in Christmas. People get so uptight about the way some people celebrate Christmas. And Christmas is a celebration of Jesus. That's all it is. Some people think you shouldn't have Santa Claus, you shouldn't have the secular movies or anything that isn't explicitly biblical. They're concerned that pagan rituals that have been absorbed into our celebration of Christmas is somehow corrupting the true meaning of Christmas. Other people use that same argument to downplay Christmas as a Christian holiday, and they say it's all some sort of corporate conspiracy to get you to buy things that you don't need. And to those people, I have a small word of encouragement, lighten up. So long as you're celebrating Jesus in Christmas, I don't really care about the rest of it. I am not concerned if you include a fat guy in the middle of your sermon. Well, I have to in the middle of my sermon. In the middle of your celebration. I have no problem with that. I have no problem if he's got white hair because I've got white hair coming out of my beard sometimes. My wife likes to pluck it out and show it to me. <laughs> Is that what we're calling it, wisdom? Okay. Okay. And for those people who get uptight about it, you're still going to accept the gift that people buy for you. And there are much greater things to be concerned about than that. And now, I know some other people have issues around the holidays because of emotional reasons. They, they lost someone dear to them around a holiday, or maybe this is the first holiday since they've lost a loved one. And their emotions get the better of them, and they can't see past their hurt. And they take that as a reason not to enjoy a holiday or that it's tainted for them. For some days, for some people, a holiday is only a reminder of a dear one's absence. And I can understand that. I think everyone can understand that. And what we have to do in those situations is conquer our emotions. It's okay to be emotional, but it's not okay to let your emotions rule you. You have your emotions, they do not have you. No, but however, none of that is what stops me from getting into the spirit of Christmas. For me, it's the expectations. And I don't know if I'm being too personal, but y'all are here, so unless you walk out, I assume we're, I'm doing okay. the rigmarole of having to go here and there and yonder, be at the right events at the right time, have the right food ready to bring along, not to mention shopping for all of the things that go along with that, wrapping, bringing the right presents for the right people, for every function. It's kind of a lot. 
There were a few years where I counted my wife and I had a combined total of no less than six or seven obligations between Christmas and Thanksgiving. That was without work things. That was without friends saying, hey, do you want to come over? It kind of sucked the joy out of it for me, if I'm honest, because I let it. And living up to those expectations is a daunting task. And I know that in some respects, I am more of a Grinch about things than others. That may not be what you want to hear someone behind the pulpit say, but sometimes I am more of a Grinch about things than others. My wife and my mother see the Christmas opportunity as an opportunity. It's a chance to get to give to people and see the reaction on their face when they open up whatever it is you got for them. They see them as opportunities, not obligations. And that's the separation. And what's helped me to change my perspective is the Magnificat. The Magnificat is the fancy name they gave to Mary's recorded song of praise in Luke chapter one. It's, it's recorded after she tells her cousin, cousin Elizabeth that she had been chosen by God to bear the baby Jesus. But when we first meet Mary in Luke chapter one, she's a virgin girl engaged to a man named Joseph who is a descendant of David. Other than that relation, she appears to just be a random person. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we are going to get all the way through 38. We're just taking them in bite-sized pieces. Oh, and I like the amplified translation for those who may not know. Now, in the sixth month after that, after Elizabeth had been told that she would get pregnant, or Zachariah was told, anyway. In the sixth month after that, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee named Nazareth. To a girl having been married and a virgin engaged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph, a descendant of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now this girl appears to be random, but don't you and I, I like to ask a lot of questions as some of you know, don't you and I just seem random from the outside? To ourselves, a lot of the time we don't think of us as anything special. But God sees us differently, doesn't he? He has a plan for each of us that is specific to us and the race that we are running. In verses 28 through 33, it says, And he came to her and said, Hail, O favored one, endued with grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed, favored of God are you before all other women. But when she saw him, the angel, she was greatly disturbed and confused at what he said and kept revolving in her mind what, su what such a greeting might mean. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace or free, spontaneous, absolute favor and loving kindness with God. And listen, you will become pregnant and give birth to a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great or eminent and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his forefather David and he will reign over the house of Jacob throughout the ages and of his reign there will be no end. Now I was talking about earlier the expectations of the holiday season. I don't think I am ever going to face such a high expectation as what Mary just got told. She got told that she had been chosen by God to bear the Christ child and be his mother. Now, I, I'm, I'm only a dude. I am never going to know what it's like to be pregnant. I'm never going to know what it's like to give birth. And in perfect honesty, I'm quite okay with that absence of knowledge. But it would kind of freak me out to find that out. I'm only me. I understand that. But it would kind of freak me out if I was a 14-year-old girl to be told, oh, by the way, God's got a plan. And it starts now. I love Mary's response. Both parts of it. Verses 34 through 38. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be? 
since I have no intimacy with any man as a husband. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you like a shining cloud. And so shall the holy, the pure, the sinless thing or offspring, which shall be born of you will be called the Son of God. And listen, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is now the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing is ever impossible, and no word from God shall ever be without power or impossible of fulfillment. Then Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to what you have said. And the angel left her. Mary starts by posing a logical question to the angel Gabriel. If I'm a virgin, how can I get pregnant? I think that would be kind of a roadblock. Huh? In the natural, yes, it would. The angel explains that the Holy Spirit will provide the seed for the baby. He goes on to tell her about Elizabeth's pregnancy and finishes by reminding her that nothing is ever impossible with God. And no word that God gives is ever beyond fulfillment. Her response is the basis, her second response in this passage is the basis of my change in perspective. I am the servant of the Lord and let it be done. The Amplified doesn't say it that way. The Amplified makes it more involved, but I didn't want to read that verse again. I am the servant of the Lord, let it be done. Mary didn't focus on the problems that waited for her. She didn't think about the social stigma of being an unwed, pregnant 14-year-old girl. She didn't worry about the pain of delivery, how it would affect her day-to-day life. And if she did have those concerns, we aren't told about them. We aren't told if she wanted to reject this message because she didn't think she was worthy of it. Yes. She did face the possibility of being stoned to death. Yes, it would. It would absolutely be scary. And we aren't told if she wanted to reject the message that the angel had given her because she didn't think she was worthy of it. Instead, she received the blessing that God had for her in her pregnancy. Now, between verses 38 and 46, Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who is pregnant with John the Baptist. And when Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah, was told about the upcoming pregnancy in the beginning of Luke 1, the angel Gabriel told him that the baby would be filled with Holy Spirit while still in the womb, which was a very uncommon thing. The Holy Spirit wasn't as readily accessible then as it is to us now. When they meet, and it's recorded, Elizabeth tells Mary, She knew she was pregnant because the baby in her belly was jumping for joy at being near the baby in her belly. The Holy Spirit in John the Baptist recognized Jesus before either of them were technically out in the world. I love that. I just love that. I could go on a little tirade about Roe versus Wade right now, but it's not what I'm about. not the, try to pick my moment. This ain't it. But I love that they, that they weren't born and they recognized each other. They knew because the Holy Spirit can't deny God. God can't deny himself. The Holy Spirit had to have known. But it's after that that we get the Magnificat, which is Luke 1 verses 46 through 56. And Mary said, my soul magnifies and extols the Lord. She probably didn't have that deep voice. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I'm not going to try to do a girl's voice. I got to say something about that. For he has looked upon the low station and humiliation of his handmaiden. For behold, from now on, all generations of all ages will call me blessed and declare me happy and to be envied. For he who is almighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name, to be venerated in his purity, majesty, and glory. 
and his mercy, his compassion and kindness towards the miserable and afflicted is on those who fear him with godly reverence from generation to generation and age to age. He has shown strength and made might with his arm. He has scattered the proud and haughty in and by the imagination and purpose and designs of their hearts. He has not put down the mighty from their or he has put down, forgive me, he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled and satisfied the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty handed without a gift. He has laid hold on his servant Israel to help him to espouse his cause in remembrance of his mercy, even as he promised our forefathers to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her, Elizabeth, for about three months and then returned to her own home. Mary's proclamation was written down and has been remembered for about 2,000 years. She recognized the blessing that she had been given. She understood how much God had done for her and how he had been working toward this moment since before creation. That's what was happening with her. What was happening with her at that moment was the fulfillment of what God had promised Abraham in Genesis 15. When God went, put Abraham into a deep sleep, told him, I will be your exceedingly great reward. Put Abraham into a deep sleep, killed a bunch of animals and spread them around because for two people to be in covenant with each other, they had to walk down the middle. Abraham was passed out and God the Father and God the Son walked through to make that covenant. And now, in Luke chapter 1, it's all coming to a head. Everything that the Old Testament had been pointing toward, which was the birth of Jesus, was happening. And Mary might, I, I'm not her, so I can't speak with any authority, but Mary might have been given a revelation of how great the moment that she was being a part of was. She was at the very beginning of the special assignment that God had for her. And like I said before, God has a special assignment, a special task, an individual race for each of us. We have the race we're running filled with many different seasons. And the season of Mary's mothering Jesus lasted for 33 years. We know she wasn't perfect in her being Jesus' mother. She lost him when she was 12. And they had to go back, I think it's two days' journey, to find him. And they found him at the temple. Mary was a part of Jesus working the first miracle in his ministry when he turned water into wine at the wedding feast. And she was there when he was crucified. She was there with him, mothering him his entire life. She never wavered from the assignment that she had been given. Now, would you and I have done the same thing? Would we have seen this incredible assignment as a blessing or as an inconvenience? It changed Mary's life. In Luke 1, this young woman is being given an immense responsibility, and she saw it through to its completion. When I think about having a hard time getting into the Christmas spirit, I feel like a toddler throwing a temper tantrum. I'm not saying we shouldn't feel bad about something because someone else has had a harder time than we have. That invalidates emotions. While your emotions are real, they're not always true. That's a different thing, though. That, but telling you not to feel anyway is wrong of me to do. When we have a hard time with something, there's no shame in recognizing it. Jesus wept for Lazarus before he raised him from the dead. God knows we have these emotional moments, and I'm very thankful that God knows we have these emotional moments. God knows the trials and the tribulations we have to go through, and thank God he's on the other side to receive us when they're done. Now, I use the same phrases over and over because repetition legitimizes. The whole time 
that we see Mary in the Bible, she keeps what I like to call the proper perspective. I think I like that because of the alliteration. The same way that in Hebrews 12, we're told that Jesus kept looking toward the prize and he disregarded the shame of the cross. Mary accepted her task and she chose to do it to the utmost of her ability. When the race we're running seems insurmountable or we've been asked to carry a load that we hadn't expected, I encourage you to look at the ways that God has blessed you, the way that Mary did. Remember, God's plan for our lives is still unfolding. We have been put where we are, when we are, for a reason that God ordained. Now, even when attacks of the enemy try to overtake us, we can remember that God can use evil plans for good. Joseph said that in Genesis 50, verse 2. And when I think about the holiday season, I, I know I'm running kind of short tonight. When I think about the holiday season, I have to forget the expectations that steal my joy. I remember that I am blessed to live in a country that celebrates Christmas because not all of them do. I'm blessed to have a family at home that I love and that loves me. I'm blessed to be in a position to be able to afford to buy presents for all of my family and friends. I'm blessed that I have a family and church functions to go to to celebrate Jesus' birth with others. I can choose to be joyful instead of anxious in this season. But beyond that, this is the time of year when people feel the most hopeless. It's a sad thing to report, but it has been shown statistically that the holiday season is when the most suicides happen. It's when the most overdoses happen. It's when people feel the most hopeless. And instead of letting anxiety and expectations steal my joy, what I can do is be a light and a picture of Jesus to those people suffering in this dark and dreary world. I can be an uncomforting, I can be, I get my words mixed up, forgive me. I can be a comforting presence and an encouraging word when they need it. God still works in and through each of us. We all have the same Holy Spirit living in us. And I propose that we make acting Christ-like our top priority instead of just being able to buy the most expensive presents or cooking the best dish at the family get-together. I am all for competitive cooking, and if you think you can beat something, let me know. I will, be, I will happily be an independent judge. <laughs> that we make Christ the focus of Christmas in our actions instead of only our words. And then, I really think Christmas wouldn't be such a daunting proposition for people. And I know that this isn't my normal sermon. I normally have a lot more scripture. I normally have about five more pages of notes. But this is what God gave me this week. And I don't know if anyone else deals with those same issues getting into the spirit of Christmas. I don't know if other people have had to fight anxiety. I don't know if other people have had to fight expectation or fight the emotions that come with someone not being there. I don't know. But what I do know is that God is still good. I do know that Jesus is still alive. I do know that his joy is our strength according to Isaiah 40, 31. I know that our faith can still move mountains. I know that my race isn't done because there's no chariot of fire right here to take me home. And by the way, that is my expectation. Unless there's a chariot of fire that comes down to get me like the prophet Elijah, I assume I went too soon. <laughs> oh, come on, folks. I try to have a little fun. What I would encourage you to do is to look at it, look at this season, look at this time, the people you get to interact with, even in this COVID-tinged holiday. 
And I pray that you would choose to see it as an opportunity. That you would let God work through you. Because only you can run the race God has for you. Only you can touch people and affect their lives in your specific way. As we go from here, I pray that this word of encouragement or self-reflection, I don't know what to call this one, I, but I pray that the word would go deep into your hearts, that it would take root, that we would leave here changed for the better, that we would look more like Jesus in all that we say and do and act and think, that we would be like James says, we would be doers of the word and not hearers only. If you'd be kind enough to bow your head and close your eyes, I'm going to pray and then I'll dismiss. Father, thank you so much for the time we've had together tonight. Lord, I pray that this, this word wasn't just me. I pray that you were able to say something through it. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for this Christmas season. Father, thank you for your mercy and your kindness and your goodness. And as we go from here, I speak a blessing on everyone here, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual, the six major areas of life. Father, bless these people in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they'll say, surely these people have been with Jesus. If you receive that, say amen. amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, if you're watching online and you feel like giving, you can go to heartofgodfellowship.com. There's an easy giving tab to go to. If you're here in person, there's an offering plate behind me. I promise any check that has a comma in the number part, we will write you a receipt tonight. Outside of that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. Know that I love you terribly. There is absolutely nothing you can do about it, and we will see you next time.